right, everybody. Welcome back. This is episode 14 of Games with Co. We're going to keep working on the uh, exploding balloon game. And last time uh, <coughs> we ended with, uh, we were just getting uh, mouse, mouse input working. Uh, we built this mouse state struct that we can sort of turn our strange SDL uh, button masks into an easy to use structure where we can tell if the buttons are being pressed where the mouse was. And so now we're going to uh, start actually detecting if the mouse is clicking on a balloon or not. Um, before we do that, a couple small changes I wanted to do. Uh, here, where we're creating our initial balloons, uh, balloon movements, we should really have a minus 0.25 here and here. This will make the balloons range from negative uh, 0.25 to positive 0.25, rather than all of them going in one direction or another. Like they would all be going up and to the right. Now they can go the other direction as well. Center, center the randomness around zero. Then we're going to slow down the Z movement a little bit and then do the same thing. That just makes things a little less hectic and crazy. Okay. And uh, if we go down to our main function where we create the window, we still have the old testing string here. Let's make this. So now we should see exploding balloons as the type. Okay. So last time I got this working, uh, so we knew when someone was left clicking or not. Uh, but we, what we want to do is move this into our update uh, for the balloon. So we need to give our balloon update function uh, the current mouse state. I guess current and previous mouse state. So we'll give it uh, current mouse state previous mouse state. And we'll get rid of this. Let's go change that. So back up to the top, let's find our balloons update function right here. This is going to take current mouse state and previous mouse state. And when <coughs> functions get really long like this, you can uh, put it over multiple lines if you want. All right. So we want to see if a balloon has been clicked. So first we want to check and see if, uh, <coughs> I think the way this should work is that if, as soon as someone presses the left mouse button, that should blow up a balloon. But we shouldn't keep blowing up balloons while they hold it. So it'll just be like one at a time. So if the previous mouse state was not pressed, but the current mouse state is pressed, we'll count that as a click in time to blow up a balloon. Uh, so now we need to see uh, this is the update function for one balloon. So we need to see if the mouse is on top of this balloon or not. So there's a couple ways to go about that. Let me bring up the world's most powerful image editor. And open up one of our balloons. So the easiest way to detect if uh, the XY of the mouse is on top of the balloon or not is just to treat the balloon as a box. Right, so uh, that's easy to do because it's easy to check if the X and Y is inside the box, but that would mean that clicks here in this white area would count as blowing up the balloon, and that's no good. Uh, another approach you could do if you wanted to make it pixel perfect is you could first do a test to see if a click is in the box. And then if it is, you could actually 
like have a, a, a mask image or use the texture itself, scale it to the current size and then, and then check if the XY is actually on top of one of the pixels that isn't totally transparent or not. And that would give you like a pixel perfect uh, matching. Uh, but I think in this case, we can use uh, another trick that's easy and will be really good, which is to treat uh, the balloon, the hit box for the balloon, actually treat it as a circle. And you see if you like put a circle centered just about like this, right, center it just a little bit above the middle of the texture. It's pretty much a perfect hit for what you'd want to count as popping it, right? Because clicking down here wouldn't really pop the balloon anyway. So we're going to just treat the hitbox as a circle, and we're going to center it just a few pixels uh, above the center of the texture. This would be the center of the texture. Our circle needs to go up a little bit. And that gives us a really pretty close uh, hitbox, and it'll be easy. So let's give that a try. So let's make a function that will uh, return the uh, circle that we're going to count as hitting. So that'll take a balloon receiver. We'll call it get circle. And that uh, <coughs> circle we can define with an X and a Y position for the center and a radius. That is all we need to define a circle. So we'll start out with uh, the X is easy. That'll just be the balloons X, balloons center. And the Y will be the balloons Y position minus a little bit. And then we need to scale um, how, how far up we go by the current scaling of the balloon. So. Uh, do we do that? Let's see. Okay, so we're currently computing the scale when we draw. Let's actually make a function that gives us uh, the scale, current scale of the balloon. So that way, that logic is only in one place, so we can't uh, so we can't screw up. So we're gonna make a new function get scale. We're going to take this logic right here, cut that, paste it here. So it's really good practice never to like have uh, the same code in two places because then you might forget to change one of them if you intend to change that logic. So this will be Now call it get scale, and we're going to do it here as well. Okay, so now if the balloon is at half size because it's far away, we're going to move it up half of 30. And then the radius will be, uh, let's see, that's going to be the balloon's width, again, times the scale. So we'll take the... Uh, balloons width times balloon scale, and then uh, divide by two, right? Because the radius will be the diameter will be uh, the balloon's width divided by two to get the radius. So this is going to be float thirty-two. Uh, when we're all done, though, we want an integer. Okay. And then we just return x, y, and r. And so why aren't we happy? Okay, 
good. Oh, no, wait, this should be... Doesn't really matter, but... All right, cool. So that gives us a circle. Then <coughs> we can say x, y, r is equal to balloon. Get circle. Okay, so we want to see. Uh, where mouse x is. Uh, in relation to our balloon. So we want the uh, distance from uh, mouse x, mouse y to our balloon's uh, hit circle. So we'll get the difference. And then uh, distance will equal square root of x difference squared plus y difference squared. And we need to import math. Okay. <clears throat> uh, then we need to just check if the distance is less than the radius of the balloon, then we've hit it. And let's just print line that a balloon is hit so we can test it. Should be left button, left button. Get scale, get scale, 104. Balloon dot get scale. Okay, so let's click here. Nothing. Actually, let me get rid of the. Uh, frame rate print so we can see what's going on easier. All right, looks like we're good. It's registering balloon hits, but only when I actually click balloons. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> let's do uh, the same idea, but for uh, touch events. So touch events, in SDL2 work a little differently, but you can often treat them the same as mouse events. So sometimes you can abstract the difference away for your own program if mouse events are uh, equivalent to touch events. So there's not a uh, get touch state uh, in SDL that I can see, uh, but there is a touch finger event. And the touch finger event gets you access to all this stuff. And one important thing to note is X and Y are not like the mouse. It does not give you a pixel position. It is a floating point value between zero and one. So if you, if you want a pixel position, you need to scale this by the current window size. And you can also get uh, pressure information, which is kind of cool. So <clears throat> I'm not gonna be able to show it on stream, but I did try this out on a laptop earlier. So if anyone on stream has a touch screen, uh, let me know if you run into issues with what we're about to do. So here, this is our event loop where we're checking for events. Currently, the only one we're checking for is if the window gets closed. We're going to add a new case. 
we're going to do the touch finger event. And then <clears throat> we're going to use this uh, type switch uh, a slightly different way. Um, you can get, you can assign the event type you're getting to a value E, and then inside each case, E will take on the appropriate value. So in this case, E is a touch finger event. And then we can get access to all those things we saw in the documentation, right? So we've got E.X, E.Y, and that's really all, that's all we need. So let's do uh, X is E.X times when width. Uh, Tyrano Jones in chat, uh, you're welcome. Thanks for thanks for joining us. Okay, e, oh, this should be capital X. Uh, let's see. Call this touch X. Touch Y. Okay. And then I think what we can do is just treat this like a mouse event. So that will equal touch X. Touch Y and current mouse state left button will equal true. Make that integer. If we do that though, we'll need to get the mouse state ahead of time. Otherwise, this would just get overwritten. So here we'll get the mouse state. If there's also a touch event, that's going to override the mouse event. If that's not the behavior you want, you'd want to rearrange that. Uh, good catch, uh, pair, trier, and chat. This should be height. Cool. And then I think, oh, there was an extra thing we have to do. So we have a touch finger event, but we need to figure out what kind of event it was. Um, so you can get access to type, and then type can have a number of different values. So where'd you go, browser? Oh, we're way over here. Um, type can be finger motion, finger down, or finger up. So we want a finger down. So if equals SDL dot finger down. Then we're going to do all this. Otherwise, we're not. Well, let's just make sure we didn't break anything with the mouse input. Okay, mouse input still good. So if anyone uh, on stream is following along and has a touch screen, let me know if this works. And I'll try it after the stream. And if it is broken, I will, I will fix it. OK, so I think we're good on mouse and touch input here. So now we can do sound. So sound is tricky. Um, unlike uh, drawing to the screen, you can't just play a sound and leave it and then play the next sound on the next frame of the game. Like that would sound terrible. Uh, sound frequencies are much, much faster than even 200 frames per second. Um, so what happens instead is that each frame, you fill up a buffer. So on your computer, why is that? So dark. There we go. 
Okay, so there is some hardware that plays sound, and it's got a buffer. And so what you do is once you want to start playing a sound, you put a bunch of data into the buffer. So you might fill up some number of bytes in the buffer, and then <clears throat> the sound hardware will start playing it. And it'll be like a little, a little pointer to where it's currently playing, and it'll start there, and it'll, it'll keep doing that while your program is going at its own rate. Nothing you do is going to interrupt it. And then when you come around to the next frame, you add some more data. The pointer keeps going. And you'll keep doing that. And then when you get to the end of the buffer, you start adding new sound to the back again. But this, this pointer is always going, and you kind of have to keep track of where that pointer is to make sure you're adding sound ahead of it, all right? Because if you add sound just behind it, it's no good. Um, and there's other complications too. Like if you're playing two or three sounds at the same time, you need to mix those sounds together before you dump those bytes into the buffer. All right, SDL2 is a low level library that just gives us access to what the operating system can do. It doesn't try to provide us a super complicated sound library to make all of this easy. Now there is an SDL2 extension called a uh, mixer. Uh, which you can you can get and use. Um, we're not going to use that right now. We're going to keep things really simple. But keep in mind, if you want to do complex things with sound, there's an SDL2 mixer extension. And the Go bindings for SDL2 already support this, but you still have to download the DLL um, for your system, Windows or Linux. Linux, it's tricky to get it, which is why I don't want to do it on stream. Uh, but we're going to keep it simple. Uh, we're just going to play one sound at a time, and SDL2 does provide some helper methods to make that pretty easy to do. So, first thing we need to do is set up our audio stuff. Okay. So the first thing we need to call is, uh, yeah, open audio device. So so this can take a string, um, or you can pass it an empty string if you don't have a specific device you're going to request. Uh, is capture, what does that mean? Let's go see. Is capture non-zero to specify device should be open for recording, uh, not playback. We do not want to capture, so we're going to say false, not recording. And then it needs an audio spec or a pointer to an audio spec. So we're going to make an audio spec. Uh, SDL audio spec. Give it a pointer. To our audio spec. And I think the bindings for the open audio device uh, for Go have a little bit of a bug in them. Um, this returns two things. It returns a audio device ID and it returns, uh, I'm sorry, no this is fine. Yeah, yeah, this is fine. This just returns an ID and an error. So we'll get our audio ID and error. Then we'll check if error is not equal to nil. Panic if we get one. And then we can get our uh, <coughs> Oh, we need to load a sound file, and I've got a sound file ready for everyone. Yep, 
Yeah, so if you go to this URL, I'm going to paste it in chat. Uh, it's a zip file. It's going to have these images again, and it's also going to have a uh, an image for the explosion the animation we're going to do and a sound file. It's got a wave file. So you want to grab that and then unzip it into this directory. I guess I'll do that here since. Uh, I've got these in here. So explode and explosion. Copy. Paste them in there. Okay. So once you've got your file in there, to open it, uh, you can call sdl.loadwave. And give it the file name. Whoa. And then it wants a pointer to your audio spec. So this, this is where I think there is a bug in the bindings. So you can get a uh, the bytes that represent your WAV file, and it also returns an audio spec, but you're already like changing the audio spec because you passed a pointer, um, so I just ignore it. Underscore means I don't want this result. Okay. And then <clears throat> we can use the fur to free the wave. All right, now we're going to make uh, another struct similar to our motivation with the mouse, where we can sort of store all the stuff, all the state of our audio stuff that we just got. So we're going to make a type audio state struct. And that's just going to have our uh, explosion bytes. And it's going to have our device ID. And our audio spec. Pointer to audio spec. And back down to where we're setting up our audio. We're going to get uh, audio state and explosion bytes, audio ID, and oh, audio spec. Why is this unhappy? Uh, not enough arguments to call. Okay, so there's two more arguments here. Um, allowed changes. Okay, obtain this. This is just going to be nil and zero. Okay, audio state declared and not used. So we're going to pass this audio state to our update so we can play the sound. So back up to our balloon update. This is going to take a pointer to our audio state. Make that a pointer. Okay. <clears throat> 
Okay, so now instead of uh, just printing that a balloon got hit, we can actually uh, play a sound. So the one helpful function you get for playing sounds, if you only need to play one at a time, is I think it's called Q Audio. Yes. So we're the SDL Q Audio. And we give it our device ID and our data. So basically what happens when you call this is that that buffer we talked about, um, where did Milton go? My drawing is gone. Oh well, that buffer that we were talking about that you fill up, um, when you queue audio, that basically puts your entire sound file into a uh, buffer that SDL manages. And SDL will then uh, get that queued up into your audio hardware. But we also have to tell it to start playing the sound. And uh, we do that with a very non-intuitive call, pause audio, or pause audio device. And again, it needs our device ID. And then we say false. So the way that you play the sound is you tell it to not pause anymore. It's a little weird, but not too bad. OK. So let's give it a try. Is that coming through on stream? So you'll notice there's a little bit of a bug. So if I click on a couple of balloons in a row, it plays the sound over and over after I'm done. <laughs> a little too loud, maybe? Right, so I'll click it once. Seems like everything's fine, but if I go one, two, it's like waiting for the whole first sound to finish before it starts playing the second sound. So that's because it's just doing exactly what we tell it, which is it's queuing the entire sound the multiple times into a big buffer, and then it's playing one and then the next, which is not really how we want it to behave. Um, in a perfect world, what we would do is actually play both sounds at once, right? We'd, we'd mix the sounds and have both sounds going on at once. Uh, but that is going to take too long for tonight. But what we could do instead is just clear the queue. So there is a clear queued audio. Give it the device ID. So now if we hit two in a row real fast, it's just going to stop playing the first one and start playing the second one again. All right. Pretty good. Okay, so now the final step is making this actually play an explosion animation and then make the balloon disappear when we click on it. So uh, the way animations work with sprites typically is you just show a series of images. So this is uh, an explosion image. Uh, again, both this uh, uh, this image and the WAV file are from Open Game Art, and the zip file you downloaded has uh, the credits for these inside of it. And let me show that real quick because, uh, oh, I didn't copy over the latest. So the balloons are by Kerry Coombs, the explosion by Cusco, and the explosion sound by Iwin Gabovich. And you can see all their stuff on Open Game Art. All right, so <clears throat> the animation. Um, you notice this is like uh, multiple images inside of one image file. That's a really typical thing you do with, with games. It's more efficient to have a bunch of sprites in one image. Uh, and then when you load it up into a single texture, uh, that's more efficient than having like dozens of textures or dozens of files that you're loading. So people tend to pack them 
together. And there's all sorts of different strategies for how you can pack your sprites together efficiently to use as little memory as possible. And all sorts of schemes for your code to know where to find each sprite in the large image. Uh, now this one's pretty simple. Uh, it's just a grid. Uh, so when we play this animation, if we want to play it like probably in this order where we, we grow the explosion, right? So we're going to want to walk through this image getting just a rectangle out of it each time. Each of these is 64 by 64, so they're, they're squares. And we're going to play one at a time. And we're going to show each one for a certain amount of time so that it looks like a nice progressively go growing explosion. And that's really all there is to animations is just playing a sequence of images. And let's start, let's start setting that up. So we're going to add some things to our balloon struct. Um, we're going to have to keep track of whether our balloon is exploding and whether it has exploded, whether it's done. And we're going to keep track of a time when it started exploding because we have to keep track of time to know which part of the animation we're going to play on each frame. And then we will have a variable to store our explosion interval. This will be how long we're going to show each image. Uh, we don't know how long that'll be yet. We'll have to experiment. Maybe it's 10 milliseconds. Maybe it's 100. So we'll, we'll be able to configure that and experiment. And then we're going to need our explosion texture. We're just going to have one texture for the whole explosion. And then we will get pieces out of it. Okay. And this is something that uh, on, a, on a bigger project, you might want to pull all this stuff out into like a separate animation struct. And we might do that later. But for now, we're just going to keep it, keep it in, our, in our balloon. But you, could gen you can imagine generalizing all this stuff with, is, you know, is the animation in progress? Is the animation done? Animation start, and so on. OK. So in our update, do we need to do anything with animating on the update? Um, not yet. Most of our work is going to be in the draw function. So let's go to the balloons draw function. And we're going to see if all right, if we've set exploding to true, that's going to mean we're, we're going to be playing our animation. Um, so we want to know how many animations we're going to play. So this is four by four, so there's 16. And we're going to want to know how much time has elapsed so far during our animation. So that'll be time.sense balloon.animation. Oh, explosion start. We'll get that in milliseconds. And then we're going to want to uh, get an index to see, <clears throat> we're going to consider this like number, number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. We're going to want an index uh, based on the elapsed time. So uh, we'll take the uh, animation elapsed divided by the explosion interval. Right, so how much time has passed divided by how much time per frame of animation we want to we want to do. Um, but then because this is kind of starting backwards, like instead of going one, two, three, we're going this way. We're gonna reverse this, and the minus one is just to make it zero based. 
or this would be numb animations. And then uh, we got to make this an integer. And this is a float 32. <coughs> Animation elapsed should be a float 32. Okay, now that we have an index, we want uh, the x, y associated with that index. Um, and that's similar to, um, I think we did this in Pong, but we're just going to take the, uh, so animation x is going to equal the animation index mod four, right? Because we have a four by four here. It's so the width is four. And then animation y is equal to the uh, animation index minus the animation x divided by four. Um, but that just gives us a uh, like the x, y in terms of like one, two, three, four, but this is actually a 64 by 64 chunks. So we're gonna to need to multiply. By 64, and then we need to do the same thing for animation x. But we don't want to multiply by animation x here because we're trying to get the base y index there. So we'll do it after. Okay. <clears throat> so now Right, so now we have the x, y position of the animation we want to play, right? So the first one's going to be here, second one's going to be here, and so on. And we want to grab that whole rectangle for each area of the animation we want. So we're going to make an animation rect. And that's just animation x, animation y, and then there's 64 by 64. Right, so it's x, y, width, and height the rectangle. And then once we have that, we can call renderer.copy just like we do to draw the balloon. We say we want to use the explosion texture, but this time instead of passing nil for the source, the source rectangle is our animation rectangle. And then the destination rectangle, we can use the same one as our balloon, which will put our animation and draw it right on top of the balloon. Uh, oh, this should be curly braces on the rectangle. And this also needs to be N32. Animation Y needs to be spelled correctly. All right, so that should draw the appropriate thing. And then here, this is where we decide that the balloon is exploding and update. We need to set Exploding equal to true and set the initial time. Explosion start equals time dot now. So that we can start the explosion animation. And then the other thing we need to do in update is check to see if the explosion uh, needs to be over or not. And one way we can do that is 
do the same thing we do to get the uh, animation index right there. If that is less than zero, then we know we're done. So blue is not exploding, but it is exploded. Okay, so another Go language thing. Um, our balloon struct is pretty big and complicated now. And up till now, we've been using the, the syntax where we just create the struct by passing in everything in order. Now, if you're familiar with other languages, there's a concept of a constructor, which is a special function that will uh, fill in a, a type exactly the way you want to. Go does not have a built-in concept of constructors. People just use a uh, convention. So if you want to make something that acts like a constructor for a struct, you just call it new and then the struct name and then have it return the struct you want. And the point of having something like this is it you can guarantee that your uh, balloon gets created properly. So if you came back to this code later or someone else came back to it and they didn't know exactly what balloon had to fill in, what could be nil or what couldn't be nil. Um, if you have a constructor, then they know, okay, I just call the constructor, that tells me what I have to do, and then you make sure everything is set up properly in your constructor. So it just makes the code easier to deal with. So we're definitely going to need a texture to draw. We're definitely going to need a position and direction. We're going to need the explosion texture. And that should be all we actually have to pass. And then in here, we can go ahead and get our texture size so that someone creating a balloon doesn't have to pass in the width and height. We can figure it out from the texture. And we can make our balloon with the texture, position, direction, the width and height we got. Uh, false for exploding, false for exploded. We'll just give it a time for the explosion start, doesn't matter. And here we can pick our explosion interval. So we can try 50 milliseconds and pass the explosion texture. Too many arguments. Let's see. Texture, position, direction, width, height, exploding, exploded, time. Oh. Curly braces, not parents. All right, now we need to go use that here. So inside of a uh, load balloons, you can delete the part where we're getting the width and height because the constructor is going to do that now. And we're going to say new balloon and pass it the texture, position, direction. And we're going to need the explosion texture. We don't have yet. So let's load that up. So we have a lot of code here for taking an image the front that Golang loads and creating an SDL texture out of it. Um, we're going to have to do that again to load our explosion texture, and we don't want to repeat ourselves. So let's pull this out into a uh, separate function. Image to texture, we'll call it. That's going to need a renderer. And it's going to need an image. Uh, let's see. It's going to be and it'll ret 
turn a pointer to SDL texture. Up here, we need to import image to be able to refer to it, I believe. Okay, so now we're going to take all of this code from here. All the way to here. Cut that out and put it up in here. And this will no longer be balloon pixels, but just pixels. Pixels, pixels, pixels. Pixels. Then we need to return the texture. This will be image to texture, renderer, image. All right, and then we need to do it <coughs> uh, in file. I guess we could actually make this image file to texture. And just have it taken as string. So then we could grab all of this also. Move all of that into image file to texture. Just pass it the balloon string instead of the image. Cool, that's easy enough. Then we'll need to do the same thing with our explosion. So explosion texture is equal to image file to texture renderer. Uh, what is it? Explosion.png. Now we have an explosion texture. What else do we need to do? I don't know. Let's see if it works. Oh, wait, we still have an error. Oh, we no longer need image imported. All right. All right. It's doing stuff. All right, we can see one bug though. If we hit multiple balloons, it's making it's making all of them explode. So that's not good. So what we need to do is we only want to draw the animation on the topmost balloon. And currently we are uh, to update or to draw the balloons, we are looping through them from back to front. So what we might want to do is have a separate loop for drawing the animation. Or not for drawing the animation, but for setting whether a balloon has exploded or not. All 
trying to think about the best way to do this. That's pretty cool though. Let's make it a little faster. So let's make this uh, 15, 20 maybe. Another trick we could do is make it a little bigger. So let's make the explosion. Uh, where are we drawing it? So let's expand this rectangle a little bit. So let's do. Uh, Make it twice as big. All right, <clears throat> we're about to run out of a uh, time for tonight, but we got pretty far. It looks pretty cool, but we need to make it only do the uh, explosion animation on the topmost balloon. And we also need to make uh, the balloon go away after it explodes. We're not doing that yet either. So that'll be two things we can do uh, first thing next episode. And that'll pretty much uh, wrap up the little balloon game. Uh, so we can finish that up next episode. And then uh, the next project is going to be uh, genetic algorithms. We're going to do uh, random images that we evolve to look cool. Uh, with a genetic algorithm. And we're going to learn lots of cool computer science stuff and draw lots of cool pictures. Um, I do have a homework idea for everybody. And <clears throat> I strongly encourage you to give this a try. Uh, it's always really good to actually try some stuff totally on your own. It's the best way to get understanding. So we're currently sorting with Go's built-in sort. And that is a good general purpose sort. Uh, that, that should handle all kinds of different inputs and perform well. Uh, but our sorting is, our balloons are always going to be almost entirely sorted already because each frame we sort it, they only move a little bit and we sort it again. So the input is usually almost entirely sorted already. And when that is the case, there is a faster type of sort called insertion sort. And if you Google that, Wikipedia has a really good article on it where you can see the algorithm and it's even got some pseudocode for how to implement it. So what I would try to do is try to sort the balloons with insertion sort and then <coughs> time it very carefully to see if you can beat Go's built-in sort. So that could be hard to do because Go's built-in sort was written by lots of people with a lot of experience, making sure it's as efficient as possible. But you have two things going for you. One is insertion sort should be quicker for this kinds of input. And two is you do not have to use interfaces to sort it. The generic built-in sort has to use, remember this interface system, to do the sorting. And there's some overhead involved in using interfaces this way. You will not have to do that. You can sort the balloon structure by hand. So you've got two advantages over the experts. So there's basically two parts to this. First is implement it, get it working, and then test it versus the built-in sort to see uh, how much time you can save, if any. And to do that, you may have to crank up the number of balloons quite a bit because it's going to be very fast either way, and it's hard to measure small differences. Uh, you may also have to measure it over multiple frames and add, add up the time and then divide to get an average. So this is a fun homework. It is sort of a rite of passage for programmers to implement sorting algorithms at some point. So this will be your rite of passage. All right, any questions about what we've done today or what's coming up? Any criticisms or 
questions about previous episodes, uh, fire away. I'll hang out for a couple minutes. Blow up some glass. My four-year-old uh, loves this game, by the way. He improves. He likes there to be 1,000 balloons. All right. Good night, everybody, and uh, I'll see you next episode where we'll finish up the balloons and start some genetic algorithms. Good night.